It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Christine Thompson, PhD in molecular medicine from the University of Ulm. Uh, Dr. Thompson is the chief business officer of uh, Uric Care, one of the most dynamic life science startup studio in Europe. Um, Dr. Thompson is an expert in biopharma business development. Uh, from basic research to clinical development and pharmaceutical drug manufacturing, having Dr. Thompson expertise to back your startup, your startup at Uricare will be precious. Will be precious. Uh, nice to have you, Dr. Thompson. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Very nice to be here as well, Ari. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, this this interview will be in two parts. You know, it's, it's the is the the game of this uh, interview. One we will talk about shortly about you know your path from uh, your PhD to the bio to, to the bio business uh, uh, world um, and then we will talk about your position at Uricare so maybe you could uh, talk about a little bit about yourself and how you decided to 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 abandon the academic career of a researcher and but to commit you know to help the other academics to to to, to launch business yeah thanks um I think for a number of, of years, I was really ingrained into the academic fabric. My father had been a researcher uh, growing up. I spent a lot of time with him uh, going to his microbiology lab and uh, doing you know, science fair projects with him. And uh, then he uh, started his own startup company, which ultimately failed. But I saw him you know, going on the weekends to do his MBA. And I, I think that was really something which influenced me, um, you know, to see someone trying to get out of academia uh, and whether it failed or not, just the adventure of doing that was very exciting. But I, I really, you know, keep the message with me that it's not necessarily easy to do, um, you know, to find the right avenues, the right doors, the right, uh, the right way. So this is definitely influencing me today at, at your care, but to, to come back, um, I worked, you know, for several years within uh, academia, but also on, on projects which were directly translational. So real access to patients, working on projects with PTC Therapeutics, for example, or Boring or Ingelheim, where you had the feeling that if you make the great discovery, it's going to get to the market someday. So I think that when I was continuing at some point and feeling a little bit further away from that uh, connection, I realized that my motivation was waning a little bit for my academic career and that it was time for me to make a transition. I was very lucky because I was accepted to a mentoring program, which is organized by the DIA Association in the U.S., and I was put in partnering with Jeffrey Sherman, who is at Horizon Pharma, and he was absolutely amazing. He uh, really looked at my CV and advised me to consider a business development and put me in touch with a lot of other people. And basically the feedback of everyone was the same. Uh, and I looked at all the different types of pharma posts and definitely felt that uh, BD would be the best fit for me, for my personality. And then managed to convince a startup company to take me uh, with, with zero experience in BD, but I told them that I would work very hard for not very much money, <laughs> I should say. And as well that I would uh, focus on some other tasks which were within my experience level. So then they felt like they were getting a kind of a two for one a deal. Uh, and that was a great opportunity. It really allowed me to develop the competencies within business development. And I realized that I had a, a real passion for that. Um, as I, I went on in my career, I've really seen all the different you know, scales of drug development. And I started as well um, coaching some students in their MBA on how to create their startups. And I realized that was something which kind of, you know, now coming back to what I saw my father going through, I was very passionate about was, you know, how to, to help people along this journey. And as well, um, I was involved in some different mentoring programs, mentoring particularly women who were interested to get out of the academic sector and feeling a little bit uh, nervous about how to do that. I, I did feel that leaving academia for me, it was a little bit like being cut out of your family. In the end, I think everybody was really happy to see me succeed, but that was my fear. My fear was that uh, people would not accept that, uh, that change in my career path. But ultimately, I think, um, you know, the mentors and advisors, which I had, which were the most supportive, are really happy to see me doing well and, and making a positive change for other people today. Could we say that uh, maybe uh, 
the the era you know that we live now has also favor you know this uh, this this uh, this support uh, because maybe uh, 10 years before uh, your generation uh, the, well, it was much much more difficult you know, to get out of the academic because there were not so so much possibilities uh, mm -hmm. so may, do you think that there is also a kind of uh, you know maturity of the of the ecosystem of uh, something that could have could also help it you know your transition Maybe in part, um, I think there's more awareness today that there's not enough academic posts mm -hmm. for everybody. So I think even within academic institutions, they realize that a certain percentage of students will have to leave. And it's in your interest to make them aware of that uh, as early as possible and to help them find these alternative paths. Because you know, after an eight year postdoc, uh, what do you do? Stay as a research technician the rest of your life? I think we start to realize now, uh, and academic, you know, institution as well, that that's not a real viable uh, career path. Um, I think that there is still some hurdles, you know, because um, we still do feel a real um, loyalty to our PhD advisor, right? So it also really depends on their point of view. If the PhD advisor, is really open-minded and accepts us to go to industry or to create our own startup, then that makes us feel really welcome into that community or to leave, you know. But if they pressure us to stay on the postdoc and to, you know, publish and that it's, a, we feel that we're kind of promoting their own research by staying, it's very difficult to get out of that. And I think that endures today. And of course, and you're absolutely right. There is there is also a point that you I, I, I would like to raise now because during this discussion is this this kind of opposition between between the uh, the need uh, the need of the academics you know, to publish and and when you publish your 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 discovery on, is in, on the public space mm -hmm. uh, and the need of a startup to have IP you know uh, intellectual properties. So this very contra contradictory in kind of you know, fighting, you know, the neg strong negotiation between do we publish or do we patent? Do we, you right. know, this, this kind of all uh, this kind of discussion, discussion and you, you say the, 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 the principal investigator should be very open minded and to understand that both ways are, are great and he, they, they, they have to, to, to dig the, the two ways and the two ways and, and uh, because both are bring a return for, for their own career as, as academics. Uh, but also for their for their student and their postdoc, so it's very great to to so it's it's a message to the academic world be open minded. Well, I think we I mean we've seen at least in in my lifetime a real transition because you know science when I was a, was a kid when my father was a researcher it wasn't about impact factor right it was about uh, the conferences you presented at, you know, maybe the, the journals you published in, but not in terms of impact factor and, and the kind of way you were perceived within the scientific community. And then it started going towards citation number, and then we got to impact factor. And now it's, um, I think, moving into something different because we do have, you know, like um, uh, online sources for data now, which are, are a little bit less related to impact factor. But um, I think we are transitioning in this period now of saying as well, well, it's not just about IP either, because mm. um, there is this kind of tendency now just to patent everything. And I think that's not the, the right approach either. So we somehow need to, um, to come up with a new metric because it seems that we're really dedicated to, to metrics within this field. But um, I think it'll be a combination. And that's what we're trying to do is, at your care as well, is to look outside of the, just the defined metrics today and really understand you know, the potential of a researcher and of a technology without just relying on, on impact factor or citation number. Um, we're looking at startup projects where there isn't any IP existing already. So I think uh, the model is, is changing and becoming more flexible. Uh, just before we jump into the Eureka, uh, your position at Eureka, you work at, for some prestigious uh, organization, uh, Bioaster of Pharma. Could you say some anecdotes about your, your experience during this, this, uh, this past uh, adventure with them? Uh, because I would like also my audience who are PhD students and postdocs to understand what exactly, you know, what uh, as a business developer you do every day uh, in your job. Sure. Well, my, my first role at Double Terra when I was in business development was really about licensing. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So you're taking assets at the company and you're trying to partner them with pharma partners. And, and it's very interesting. And the other thing I was doing was in licensing. So you're looking, for example, to take uh, academic projects from the tech transfer organizations or from smaller startups and to license them into your own uh, company. And that was really, um, I would say, really based on scientific knowledge for me because I had to analyze the projects, very early stage projects. And then kind of calculate uh, what would be the market interest, what was the IP risk, uh, et cetera. That competency I really developed uh, over time. Um, the out licensing part, you know, you make a lot of pharma contacts. It's really interesting because it's fast paced. I really liked that. It was uh, very addictive for me, um, this kind of fast paced world. Um, as well, you have to like to talk to people. It's a lot about negotiation skills, but that's something which you get in your PhD. If you're used to presenting, you get these soft skills, which could definitely make you succeed within that career. Um, after that, I went to FAMAR. Uh, FAMAR was one of the 10 largest global CDMOs uh, in the world before it was sold off. Um, I was in charge of all of the development department business. We had 12 sites in Europe, um, within FAMAR and we had a development team of 55 people. So a lot of that was um, working with different customers, doing innovation days with big pharma, you know, proposing new ideas to them, doing a kind of SWOT or gap analysis of their portfolio and seeing what we could propose within our own uh, technical capabilities. And that was really interesting because it was the first time in my life that I visited uh, a factory which actually made the medication, right? Because so many years I was working, working as a scientist where we just used, you know, uh, whatever we had in the lab and then going to the facility where you actually see all this discovery work which you've done become a reality, become tablets, become a liquid. And that was a totally different science actually because it's a way of, of bioprocess or of machines, of manufacturing, of quality control, of regulatory. And the learning of all those different pieces in order to be able to understand the customer needs uh, really helped me to develop a fuller picture. On top of that, I worked with a lot of biotechs in that role who were needing development services. And so I got a lot of expertise in understanding um, their failures and their successes. Um, that's, you know, understanding that um, if you wait too long to take certain decisions, sometimes you're really setting yourself up for failure. That was an important lesson for me. Uh, the other thing which I really enjoyed about that role was just, um, I think, the, yeah, the interaction with customers to create new products and, and really to reflect on that from start to finish. An additional part of that role was really strategic because um, they had some difficulties within the department when I came in and I was tasked with really doing a strategic analysis to create the department to be profitable. And that required me to go into a deep dive of all the issues, the things that were working, the things were not working. It was a huge work. It doesn't mean that you're always really liked um, because sometimes your colleagues don't wanna change. But in general, um, it taught me uh, a lot about the business and, and also about strategic thinking. Mm. I went then to Bioaster. Bioaster is a, a private uh, research foundation funded in part by the French government, but also by private industry. And their um, strategic partnering is a little bit different than licensing because what you're trying to do is to create collaborations, but you want it to be successful for both, both parties. So it's again, really soft skills based and you have to really understand who you're, um, who you're talking to. Because on the one hand, on the collaborative side, you've got a lot of scientists, so you need to put on your scientist hat. And then on the other side, it's a business person who's just project managing this. They don't really care about the science. They just wanna you know, get it done. So um, you have to understand as well how to, to manage those different types of relationships. And as well, of course, um, even if it is a collaboration, there is still some aim of profit behind it. So you need to as well be thinking as a business person on uh, different licensing strategies, different royalties, milestone payments, et cetera. Um, so there is a kind of basic finance a role behind strategic partnering as well. Great. So after this past experiences, you were fully, uh, I mean, uh, um, fully trained um, in your skills, in your soft skills, in your hard skills, and your mindset also, because the mindset is very important also in when you do this trans kind of transition. Uh, then 
you joined Eureka, right? And yes. uh, how, could you talk about a little bit, you know, the how wh what happened when you when you joined Eureka? Was it a, a meeting? You meet someone, or someone recommended you? How how, how was it? Well, I think that Rodolf, he found my profile on LinkedIn and felt that I had everything that he was looking for. So he proposed uh, to have a chat and, and we hit it off right away. I, I actually thought at first that it was a scam because it was too good to be true. Uh, honestly, um, you know, when I saw his message, I was like, oh, it's my dream job. <laughs> How many times does someone approach you for your dream jo job? I mean, it's not very often. Usually you're looking for your dream job, right? So um it's been, I mean, the team at Your Care is amazing and, and we all work really well together. And I think that that's a big part of it. But um, no, honestly, I didn't know Rodolf before, but I told him recently, I felt that I knew him now for at least three, four years, even though we've been only working together for one year because it's a, a really good fit. Yeah. So uh, I totally align on the on the idea that if if uh, if you were, if I hear about, you know, Eureka, I don't believe it because it's so unique, you know, as a structure, as a as a way of of uh, of uh, cooking the the next generation of biotech uh, uh, gold nuggets. You know, it's 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 really unique. So yeah. we have already talked about talk about uh, uh, all this point with uh, Serge and and Rodolphe. So so people will 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 will, will have a, a panel of of different angle of the of the. It's not just, you know, saying it's unique just to be, you know, sh to show off things. It's really unique. <laughs> it is, yeah. So uh, could you talk about us, uh, about your role as a chief business officer at uh, Eureka? Uh, what does it mean to be a chief business officer? Um, because uh, at the same time, you're, you need to, to defend Eureka as an organization, but also, uh, I, I guess, all the startup you will, you will, you will create in the future, yeah. right? Exactly. Um, so being a chief business officer at your care, it's basically, um, I would say just being business, <laughs> because you're, you're involved in, in, in a lot of different things. So one part of my role is, of course, searching and evaluating opportunities with sales, uh, for example. So um, looking at the companies to invest in, um, looking at the academic projects to create startups, um, identifying what could be the right indication for their technology in terms of market need as well. So that, that's one piece. The other piece of what I do is really working with our uh, external partners. So for example, talking to pharma companies, talking to other companies, understanding what they're looking for today in five years and 10 years. Because if we create a startup and all the startups are for what people are looking for today, well, by the time they actually get to the market, no one will need it anymore. So we have to as well have this kind of um, clairvoyance, you know, um, in order to be able to uh, predict what people will want. So a lot of that is my job as well. I talk to the, the Pfizer's, the J&J's, you know, try to understand what are they looking for. And then um, outside of that, I would say as well, as you already kind of mentioned, is to take the companies in our portfolio and present them to the external partners as well to allow them to get feedback on what they're doing as early as possible because mm -hmm. it's not very easy for a startup company where you've got a young you know entrepreneur running it to go to these big companies and say take a meeting with me so this is kind of my role is to get the meetings for them or present what they're doing if there's interest try to get feedback for them try to get them key uh, I would say criteria that the company is looking for so that they can advance in that direction. And, and I think that's really key. Another role would be uh, definitely advising. So advising people on the, on the key um, you know, criteria, which other investors will be looking for as well, because at some point they will need to raise more investment uh, outside of what we can invest at your care. So I think this is part of it and if, as well just the basic business of your care itself. So we're developing a, your, uh, an AI tool internally, and then we need to contemplate the business case for that. So how many people will we need to recruit? What's the market analysis of that? Um, there is no, of course, um, creating an AI tool dedicated to synthetic biology doesn't exist on the market today. So then we need to basically create, um, you know, 
the entire, entire market forecast for that. So that's part of my role today as well. So as you can understand, a lot of different, <laughs> a lot of different hats. So it's a very challenging and very exciting as a say, I, I, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, you know, to, to live such an adventure right now because it, what we, we already to, to tell you, we've already told it, it's a unique uh, position. You know, I don't think that there is something like that somewhere else. You know, usually a business yeah. is, you know, very focused on, on one target and one product, one target. And, and now you have not only one organization, but you have plenty of projects that can, that have the ambition to become company by themselves. So will you also, uh, in your, in your vision of your position, um, follow up your, your support um, as a consulting, but also operationally as a, you know, as a, uh, as a, you know, helping uh, your, your staff, your spin of staff when they are, when they are fully structured with their own team, do you, will you follow up the, the, your support? Uh, is it something also in your, in your, uh, in your responsibilities? Yes, so I think even the companies which are totally autonomous today, I'm still presenting them externally, trying to bring contacts to them. I think for us, it's really about building an ecosystem and having an ecosystem means partners of, of different stage, companies of different development stages. So indeed, I think that beyond just the startup world, we're there for all of the companies in the portfolio and I present them you know, often to external partners and just say, oh, let me put you in touch with this person or with, with that person. Um, I think that it's part of, you know, I like building collaborations. It's probably what I liked about strategic partnering. So I really like putting people in contact with each other, even if I don't have a direct uh, benefit from that. Yeah. Um, I have, I had a question uh, about, you know, if you, if you do the difference between business exploration and business development, but you already uh, brought a, a piece of answer because you told that you, you will uh, discuss with the, industrial partner very early and during a long time you know to 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 have a, a good idea for the future what that what they could need this is what we call of course business exploration uh and for you is there a semantic difference between business exploration and business development more or more sale oriented or more marketing oriented i hadn't really thought about it before <laughs> but i think Indeed, it, it's a good idea to separate the terms because um, maybe business exploration as well for a startup company, it's interesting because maybe you have a, a technology, but you haven't fully determined the avenue that you want to take yet. So some of this kind of initial fact finding, um, you know, freedom to operate, searching um, for intellectual property, maybe all of that can be put into business exploration and maybe the understanding of the market in very vague terms as well, this fits into business exploration. Business development, I think, could be a little bit more concrete, you know, where it's saying, okay, here's the idea, we're going to put X, Y, and Z steps in place to advance that we've entered into the phase where we're now actually, um, the clock is ticking, right? And, and more and more we hear startups saying that, but for them, they see the incubator ver, you know, kind of time as being like the 18 to 24 months for reflection. So maybe that's their business exploration period. And then, you know, once that's determined, they go into the, the real business development stage. And maybe that's, it's a really good idea. I like the way that you phrased that because sometimes we see startups don't have this critical period of reflection. Mm -hmm. So then there isn't a dedicated path that they've chosen early on and things kind of go like this. And in some cases it can still work out, but the majority of cases like that, it becomes very difficult for them because they haven't uh, had a clear reflection and that becomes evident to external parties and investors. And so I think it is, it is really um, maybe the separation of the two. It's a key, key way to identify, particularly for startups, these two different phases. Particularly for deep tech startups who are very far uh, from the market. So I, I think uh, this vision is very uh, precious for them because uh, the team of the startup doesn't have uh, the time, you know, and the resource and the skills to do this kind of business exploration, they, they need to develop the tech and to find um, 
immediate application and immediate uh, uh, market target. So you can bring them this, this, uh, this, I don't know if you can say it in English, wiseness, this, this, uh, this kind of insight, you know, from, right. from several years of, of, uh, of discussion with industry, with industry executive, with uh, et cetera, with the right. also nonprofit organization and, and administration. So, so this is very precious. And, uh, uh, and once again, having all these skills, all this support in one uh, structure such as Eureka is fantastic, um, and and I, and I mean it. You know, it's a, it's a, it, we were we, we I think we we were we we were all expecting something like this to to emerge in Europe. You know, and you say it, it it's quite unbelievable, right? But uh, it's great, and we, are, we will follow uh, follow you uh, very closely because it's uh, it's so promising, and we need it in Europe. We definitely need yeah. it in Europe. Absolutely agree. I think uh, what we're doing here is is really pioneering within the European landscape, and the positive feedback we've gotten has really enforced that message to us that this is needed um, and that it is the right time for it. Um, I think that being an American, maybe it, it helps me sometimes because I can say, oh, I've seen some of these things done already in the US that would be great if we can implement this. But now having lived for more than 10 years in Europe, I understand that you can't do it exactly the same way. You have to as well have a European mentality uh, to, to make it actually happen. Uh, otherwise, you know, there will be too much kind of friction. But uh, I, I agree. I think what we're doing at your carry, it's a great story. This is why I, I'm part of it. I wake up happy to come to work every day, mm -hmm. uh, working a lot, as is everybody on the team. But I think we really believe that uh, what we're doing is able to make a difference because we talk to many startup companies where they say, oh, we hadn't thought about that. Um, you know, one thing I really like uh, to do is to leave people with something. So not just to take their presentation and say, okay, thank you for presenting, goodbye. But to say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Even if we don't invest, let me put you in contact with this person. Um, for me, I think that's part of it. You know, if it's not the right time for us to invest today, it might be in a couple of years, you never know. Um, but on, on any case, it's uh, really the transmission of all the pieces of things that all of us at your care have learned in our careers. And I think that we're able to look at things and very quickly pick out the strong points, but also the potential weaknesses and try to share those with people to say, well, here's where you might want to, to improve. Uh, here could be the drawback points. And uh, I think that's, that's really key for companies to get this feedback because otherwise you live in a bubble and uh, that's not benefiting anybody. So. Absolutely. We are reaching the end of this interview. I would like to, to keep you and talk with you hours and hours about this fantastic and exciting subject. So, but with, with everything as an end. So thank you so much. Um, maybe if you have some advice for PhD students and postdoc, or even if you have a message for the executive in, in the industry, uh, would, you have, uh, would you like to have some last words for, to, to conclude for this interview? Maybe for students, I would say, don't hesitate to, to show your CV around. Um, your soft skills are more important than you know. Um, this is really, if you've managed to finish your PhD or even a master's, you have something which is going to attract an uh, employer uh, and that you really have to, to have confidence in yourself and, and don't hesitate. Um, for employers, I would say, and, and other people within the industry, don't hesitate to look outside of the box for the right candidate because bringing someone in who's got a different experience than you, it can really change uh, your team for the better. And, and I think that this is really important. We have to stop saying there's this uh, one set pathway, you should have done this and, and then we'll hire you. I think you have to look outside of that to find the best candidates and I see it, uh, see it all the time. So. Great. And maybe uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, a book or a podcast uh, about anything, it could be about bio business, it could be about business, or it could be about philosophy, anything you want. If you have something for us to, to share. So I think it, it's not a recent book, but I think it's a timely book because um, it, recently there was the death of Paul Farmer. I don't know if you know him, but he's a physician um, coming out of the US who did a lot of... Uh, social work and studies at Harvard as well. And uh, the book is called Mountain Beyond, Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. 
and it uh, documents his work in Haiti and also in Africa. And he, he died in, in Africa, actually. And if you really want to understand pure motivation outside of money and someone who just wants to help other people, you have to read this book. And it will really help you to focus on why we're doing what we're doing. And, you know, the fact that the aim is really to get, you know, good therapeutics to patients and to improve their lives. And he was doing this uh, every day with no concern for himself and, and a very inspiring story. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I will I will add it in the in the, in the blog article uh, because it's uh, it's uh, you attract my attention with this with this uh, pitching this, this book it's very interesting uh, thank you so much for being my guest today it was uh, so good to have you uh, and, sh and, ha and and having your expertise and experiences uh, uh, for sharing for for our audience thank you so much Christine and and good luck to everything for for Yuri care thank you very much hope to meet you in person uh, in the in the next future <laughs>